Okay, let's have the uh, junior church kids, uh, the kingdom kids go out to their uh, class this morning. Oh, there's, uh, there's a special in song today. Am I, am I ahead of myself? No, we're okay. Are you singing special music today? Okay. <laughs> la, 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 la. No, I'm not. <laughs> okay, guys. It's so good to be with you and uh, to be uh, blessed by God to be in the assembly. And uh, yeah, I know, we, we did venture out in some pretty cold stuff today, didn't we? But, uh, oh, it's so warm in here and uh, good to be in the house of the Lord with, with his people. Hey, let me just say to the, the men's group uh, last week that did the, um, the Super Bowl party and the food, and then the, to have that uh, slot car track and the Hot Wheels track uh, for the kids and the kids at heart. And uh, I had a blast, and I just wanted to say a big thank you uh, for that. Yeah, well, praise God for the men and the good time we've had. Uh, let me say... You know, I know that the uh, Rotowalds are, are probably traveling home uh, from vacation, and they're watching this, so I just want to say that uh, Tom Engler did a wonderful job with Family 101 uh, this morning in the previous hour, so Tom, thank you very much for, and, and Pat, hurry home, he said. <laughs> okay, oh, mercy. Uh, it's been a great morning. Thanks to the praise team and the praise band, uh, we just fell in love with Jesus more and more, worshiping him today. Okay, be certain in your marriage. When I first started preaching uh, back in the uh, early 80s, uh, my first preaching ministry, uh, I, went, I heard that one of the members, a lady, had uh, got cancer, and so I went over to visit with her at her house, and in that, she was letting me get to know her. And in getting to know her, she pulled out a little autograph book. No, that wasn't for me to sign an autograph. This book was from 1939. So maybe it was a precursor to the high school yearbook. I, I don't know that. I don't know that. I just know that as I turned the pages and read what people wrote in her autograph book, it was crazy. I loved it. I asked if I could take the book home and write some of them down and I did, and I'm going to share some of them with you. Uh, it's like you would write something, like in a, in a high school yearbook, hope you have a great summer, and sign your name, and all that kind of stuff. And this one said, I'm yours, Till. And people, friends, wrote in, I'm yours, Till. And one was, I'm yours, Till the tree barks. And I thought that was just so clever back, back in the 80s, you know. Uh, I'm yours until Niagara Falls. And I, I like that one. Yeah, and I'm yours till the cough drops or till the goose bumps and stuff like that. But one of them, now, i got to set this one up because back in the old days when babies wore cloth diapers, you had to put a rubber pant on that baby or you would hold that baby and they'd wet on you. So you had to have rubber pants around that cloth diaper. And this one says... I'm yours till the ocean wears rubber pants to keep its bottom dry. And I really like that one, huh? Okay, so now there were some poems in the autograph book, and one poem said, Some kiss beneath the mistletoe, and some kiss beneath the rose. The proper place to kiss a girl is right beneath the, the nose. All right. One poem read, when you get married and your husband gets cross, just pick up an axe and show him who's boss. Okay. Oh, boy. You would have to laugh at that one. <laughs> or then the last one, uh, the poem, that had a little serious note to it, uh, but it's so, uh, well, we can just see this in life. And it says, they were single and they went walking and their hearts did skip a beat. As she stumbled on the sidewalk, he whispered, Careful, dear, my sweet. Then the wedding bells have rung, and they walk the self-same street. She stumbles on the sidewalk, and he yells, Pick up your feet! <laughs> I just read them the way they write them. Okay, in, in the scriptures we find in the uh, book of James, the first chapter, and verses 5 through 8. And where I'm going with this is it talks about being a double-minded man. And so let's read here, and I'll make an application, and we'll move on. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, 
who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But if he asks in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. And so my encouragement for us today is that we treat one another in our homes, in our marriages, treat one another uh, in such a way that we can survive the decades. I think it is so rich, so powerful, so beautiful when couples get to celebrate their golden 50th wedding anniversary. I love that. And I love those celebrations. But a double-minded person, a double-minded man, a double-minded woman, they're not going to see a lot of stuff in life. But havoc, woes, because they're double-minded. We need to be single-focused in Christ. And so we bring material like Family 101 during the 9 o'clock hour, and we bring messages hoping what? That we can give food for thought and a challenge that's going to say, hey, look here, I need to do that. That's doable. And we want that for our young people as well. So there's three areas to make application this morning. The first one is to be certain to complement one another often. To complement one another often. Few things in life refresh the spirit as the recognition of our importance and our purpose in another person's life. In, in our spouse's life. In our children's life. Now recently, this was, a, this was just amazing because it happened so often, I recognized it and I prayed to God and I said, God, I see what you're doing and I want to thank you. About two to three weeks ago, Several of you just began to pour into me, and you encouraged me in my heart. You said things that blessed me. And you get one like that, thank you very much. You get two like that, thank you very much. But I began to get some through phone calls and text messages from people in other states. And I went, this is you. Thank you, dear God. I celebrate that. I'm receiving what you're doing in my, in my heart. And it blessed me, and I went, wow. And so if it's true in work and in ministry to be blessed like that, isn't it true to be blessed like that in your home? And therefore I say, be certain to compliment one another often. We need that unique, sincere uh, compliments. And so we don't need to wait till Valentine's Day uh, to, to bless one another with sincere, genuine compliments. Over in Proverbs 31, please uh, take time. Uh, Psalms, uh, probably the largest Old Testament book. Proverbs is right after the Psalms. So go ahead and, uh, and turn there. Proverbs 31. 28 through 31, let's read here, about the wife, about a mother. Her children rise up and bless her, her husband also, and he praises her, saying, Many daughters have done nobly, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord shall be praised. Give her the product of her hands and let her works Praise her in the gates. And so children and husbands ought to compliment and speak well of uh, their mom and their spouse. And so we do this because of their love, their thoughtfulness, their devotion. Uh, let's, go, let's, let's stay in Proverbs, but let's go back to Proverbs uh, chapter 12 and verse 4. 12 and verse 4. Then I'm going to 18, 22, and then to chapter 19. But first of all, let, let's go to 12, uh, 4 in this uh, Proverbs book. An excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but she who shames him is like rottenness in his bones. The excellent wife is the crown of her husband. Looking over to chapter 18, verse 22. 18, 22. Uh, 
He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. 19 verse 14, a house and wealth are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife, a prudent wife is from the Lord. I, I love this. And so we, we must uh, study our spouse. We must compliment them. And, and ladies, to your husbands as well. You compliment those in your life with uh, beautiful attributes that they have. It might be the very fact that they're available. It might be that you just answer your cell phone when they call. You, they are available to you. And it might be because of their great compassion. They've, they've got a beautiful, compassionate spirit cooperation, courage. Maybe they're a very uh, creative person. They're dependable. They have determination, devotion, encouragement. They have faith. Maybe they're, as talked in Sunday school, maybe they're a great forgiver. And how beautiful attribute that is. Generosity, gentleness, gratefulness, helpfulness, honesty, meekness, uh, leadership, the, 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 the spouse has leadership in the home. Both do. And they have love and loyalty. How about reliability, resourcefulness, self-control? How about thriftiness? How about tolerance or truthfulness? Honest praise strengthens the spirit. And we need that. It enables the person to see their genuine beauty and importance as a person. And so... Listen, our James 1 text said about the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We must be of single mind and single focus. And by the way, don't get out here and mess up by thinking on the wrong person. You think on your spouse. Secondly, be certain that they know that they are the only one for you. They are the only one for you. Uh, getting back to Proverbs, we were in 31. Now I'm going to chapter 30 and verses 21, 21 through and 23. 21 to 23. She is not afraid of the snow for her household. I'm in a wrong chapter. I'm glad she's not afraid of the snow. That's a good verse, isn't it? But it's chapter 30. And looking at 21 through 23. Under three things, the earth quakes. You know, I like that. She's not afraid of the snow. I, I mean, I want to walk in that a little bit. Under three things, the earth quakes. And under four, it, it cannot bear up. Under a slave when he becomes king. And a fool when he is satisfied with food. Under an unloved woman when she gets a husband. And a maidservant when... She supplants her mistress. That right there. Spouses, we need to focus, single focus, on our spouse alone and not on someone else. And then, uh, going back to Proverbs chapter 5, Proverbs 5, 15 through 21. This is Solomon writing to his son. The letters from a dad. Letters from a dad. Dads, write your sons good letters. Not on their back, but on their side, offering advice to them. And here's what Solomon says. Drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. As a loving hind and graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always with her love. For why should you, my son, be exhilarated with an adulteress and embrace the bosom of a foreigner for the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches all his paths. His own iniquities will capture the wicked, and he will be held with the cords of his sin. He will die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly, he will go astray. I, I, love, I love that text. Boy, it should sober every man 
up. It should prepare a son for adult life that we do not act that way. And then Proverbs chapter 2, Proverbs chapter 5 and chapter 6, Solomon again warns his son. He wrote those chapters for his sons. And he wrote against immorality and against adultery and against folly. A dad's letters to his sons. Now what is folly? Today we would use the word foolishness. Foolishness. Folly refers to someone who lacks the proper fear and respect for God. He or she is therefore prone to go in the wrong direction in life. Life's decisions and choices where uh, they make the wrong choice and they bring havoc into their life and they bring havoc into the lives of those around them. They are foolish. A wise model is when mom and dad are fussing in front of the kids at home and they, the children, they know something's wrong and they know that their classmates at school, their parents divorced and they know the stories and, and mom and dad ought to strengthen the heart of the children at home when those situations happen. And you need to, to speak into their life, speak into their heart, and tell those children that uh, I love your dad, I love your mom. And that no matter what happens, I will never divorce your mother. I will never divorce your father. Children have a right to hear that. Uh, from their parents. Each day affirm and reaffirm, I love you. Every day do something for them and pay them a compliment. We must create an attitude and an atmosphere that says, are you, are you still with me, gentlemen? You need to create an atmosphere that says, I can hardly wait to be with you. This is important. There was a book written years ago and uh, it, it was by Charlie Shedd. It's entitled Letters to Philip. And it's entitled that because his son's name is Philip. And he wrote these letters to his boy. These are things he wanted his son to know. And he put it in a book for men to have something for their soul, some ideas to think on. And, and he, here was one of the advice to his son. Here goes another truth you have the right to know. That is... Nothing can turn a wife on quite like knowing that she turns you on. Something inside the most ladylike lady will respond with excitement if you find her exciting. And so the husbands that I know that I feel like they've got a good handle on their marriage, they put something into their love life that seems to say, how lucky I am to be with an exciting lady like you. And you feed that in the home, and you think like that. And, and, and one, one friend of mine, and please, ladies, don't take this wrong. Please, it's not given in that spirit. And it wasn't, it wasn't 40 years ago. But a friend of mine said, why go out for hamburger when I can have steak at home? Now, what we were talking about that day on the golf course was somebody had had an affair and they had wrecked their life, wrecked their marriage, lost their kids. And he said, why would you go out for hamburger when I can have steak at home? And what he was doing is valuing his wife. He was valuing... You're not a side of beef, ladies. That's not, <laughs> that is not what he was talking about. I know that. Men, we need to quote that often. Why go out for hamburger when we can have steak at home? Number three, and last, be certain to respect your spouse as your spiritual partner. Now, last week I closed the message with Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 33 that uh, wives, you, you respect your husbands, and husbands, you love your wives. And it's just a, a circle that'll bless your home when husbands love their wives and wives respect their husbands. And today I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. This is what I want to leave with the men. We're to be the leaders in our home, and how would you lead? Well, this is three ways you would lead in your home. 
in verse 7, You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way. As with someone weaker, since she is a woman, here it is, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life. Wow, isn't that beautiful? To show your spouse honor because she graces this life with you. She graces the home with you. And then he says something in this. He says, so that your prayers will not be hindered. In the Greek, it literally means that your prayers will not be cut out. You're a leader in the home. Shouldn't the leader's prayers be heard by God? Yes. Well, here's how they won't be heard by God when you disrespect your wife. Peter gives three instructions here. Be considerate, be respectful, be Christian. Let's look at it briefly. Be considerate, take time to study your wife, observe her, listen to her. What? I'm the leader in the house, I can't listen to my wife. Yeah, you'd probably do real well to listen to your wife. <laughs> because you're not a leader if you don't have anybody following. You know, leaders ought to look behind them once in a while to make sure there's somebody still there. <laughs> Secondly, treat her with respect. Hold her in high esteem. Value uh, her highly. One man said, stand when she walks in the room. Now, you know, if your wife and you are always, you're retired, you're always in the house, you can't stand every time <laughs> she comes into the room. It's not talking about that, is it? But it is talking about maybe you've gone to an appointment and, and they come in and you, you stand and welcome them, greet them. It might be that, you, gentlemen, you got up early uh, and, and, and put on the coffee, who knows, and then your wife gets up and you stand when she, she comes into the room. It, it's, it's an honoring thing that we don't have in our culture. And then third, you see her as a sister in Christ, that she is your partner in salvation and in, in the Word of God and in prayer and in ministry, and, and Peter is very clear that if we don't, our prayers will not be answered by God. Wow. Jesus said, a house divided against itself can what? Cannot stand, Matthew 12, 25. Well, he actually said a kingdom can't stand. He said a city can't stand and a house can't stand. Stand. And so we know a, a, a country can't stand if it's divided. We know that a church can't stand if it's divided. And we know that a home cannot stand if the home is divided. Jesus is right. Jesus said, I have loved you, so you also ought to love one another. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. You guys know that that's the love chapter. Uh, if you were going to want to talk about love, you, you could go over to 1 John. I, I love 1 John 4 uh, about love. But this, but this here, this, um, this Corinthians uh, 13th chapter. Okay. He, he actually starts it in chapter 12 and verse 31 where he says, let me show you a more excellent way. And, and so we come along, the first paragraph makes it clear that love is not an option. It is essential. And so you've got it there before you. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. If, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I, I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me what? Nothing. If we are uh, vindictive and mean-spirited, we are making a lot of noise and we are not accomplishing what's going to make our home a happy home on the golden 50th wedding anniversary. Even if others curse us, even if others call us nasty names, uh, we are still commanded to speak the truth in love. The truth in love. 
So we re-examine the attributes that are listed here in this love chapter. In verses uh, 4 through 8a, let's, let's go ahead and look at this. Four, uh, 13th chapter, 4 through 8a. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. You see, we're talking about... We're, in America, we're so hung up on our emotions. Well, I, this is how I... It's not about emotions. It's about action. Love is action, and we act this way because we love them. Yes, my emotions don't feel like it right now, but it's not about how I feel. It's about we love our spouse. Four, love is patient, love is kind, is not jealous, love does not brag, it's not arrogant, it does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, it's not provoked, uh, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Love never fails. The love chapter. Emotions are up and down. Emotions fluctuate, but love does not fail. It's, it's not, it is based on a lifelong commitment of doing what's right and proper because you love this person. If you go by your emotions up and down, you know, sometimes uh, we can, we can uh, go before God in our morning devotions and we can be thinking on a text we read, we can be praying about it, and we can go, man, oh man, God, I'm your problem child. I'm not doing so well. I could kick myself. Sin brings us down. Now, we know that God forgives, but the text, it was really talking and beating us up because of our sin. And, and, and we need to realize that while I am emotionally down at that moment reading that text and I'm praying about it, thank, thank Jesus' name that it's not based upon my emotions and how I feel about it. It's based upon what he did on the cross of Calvary. And by the way, you, you that are watching by YouTube or Facebook, we do like this in our congregation. We're pointing at a cross on the wall. And that's what I'm pointing at. It's based upon what he did on that cross. And, and I don't have to allow my fluctuating emotions get me down to mess up my day. Jesus made my day by dying on the cross for me. Emotions fluctuate, but it's based upon a lifelong commitment of seeking others' well-being more than myself. Uh, Romans 12, 9, uh, love hates what is evil and it clings to that which is good. It still chooses the right to do regardless of our feelings. And uh, young people, young people in the room, boy, you are, you are young. You can make decisions right now that you're going to live a, a different life. You're going to live in Christ. You, you're not going to make as many mistakes as your parents or grandparents. You, you're going to make them because you're human, but you don't have to make any, as many because you're going to make a decision right now. You know, I want to live that way. I want that to be for my life. I want to act like that. And the love, the, the word uh, is unselfish. Love that word, unselfish. To be able to say about somebody at a funeral, they were the most unselfish person I knew. That can be you. That can be us. They're the most unselfish person we knew. So let me close. Uh, Bob Russell, in a blog, told the story of E.V. Hill. E.V. Hill was a preacher in uh, California, in, um, in Los Angeles, and uh, he ministered in that church from 1961 to 2003 when he died. But he went through the Watts riots. And, and one thing about Hill's preaching was he would preach to both sides of the fence of the Watts riots. He didn't care. If they were wrong, they were wrong. And so, therefore, he received a lot of threats. People didn't like him because he stepped on toes. He didn't care what side you were on. He was going to preach the truth. And as a result, his life was threatened. And one day he received a credible report from uh, that anarchist 
were going to put a, a bomb in his car. And, uh, well, that's enough to rattle your nerves. The next morning, uh, he, he woke and he, his wife wasn't in bed. And so he just hollered out, hey, are you there? Are you up? She didn't answer. And he got up and he, she wasn't in the house. And so he went out and the car is gone from the driveway. And he was concerned about her. A few minutes later, she drove back into the driveway. And E.V. Hill demanded, woman, what were you doing? What were you thinking? And she said, well, I got to thinking about how needed you are in this church and community. You're, you're needed here in this community more than I am. And, and so therefore, if, if somebody was going to die, I'd rather it be me than you. E.V. Hill said, I always knew my wife loved me. But that, but that day, he said, I understood what love was all about. What about you? What about you and your spouse? What about you and your family? Are you willing to die for them? Jesus loved us so much that he proved his love and he died for us. Be certain in your marriage. Husbands and wives, can we do that? Uh, you you got to want that kind of love. And if you're going to want that kind of love from others, you've got to show that kind of love to them to get it, to receive it. So young people, you're at an age that you can choose your path. You can be that kind of person. God, not only that young person, but if you'll learn how to wait on the Lord, you can wait and God will bring you that kind of person. But it takes, it takes faith that God is going to do it, and it takes, it takes believing I'm going to wait on him because you're going to get so antsy, you're going to get tired of waiting, you're going to get depressed, you're going to get lonely, you're going to get all these things, and there's all kinds of people that are going to come into your life, and you need to know how to say no. That, that's a cool person. I, I like that person, but that's not the one. And you wait on the Lord. Because when you wait on the Lord, God sends the one he wants for you. And you must wait on him. Because if you don't, you're going to make a mistake. Well, we all make mistakes, yeah, but that's one you don't want to make. Because that one lasts a lifetime. And so, let's have an invitation. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20 is a verse for our disciples group, our disciples fellowship. And it's a verse you need to memorize yourself. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who did two things for us, who loved me and gave himself for me. That's a beautiful verse. He's already loved us he's already given himself for us now we need to learn how to give ourselves back to him we need to learn how to give ourselves back to each other one another in our family 101 today it was about forgiveness wow and if there's anything that the cross of calvary says to us it says I forgive you. You come and claim that forgiveness for yourself. You need to believe and trust that God is God and that Jesus loves you enough to die for you. You need to get serious enough to repent of your sins, all of them. But that's a long list. Well, you better start praying now. Get it cleaned up. Confess before the Lord. Then you confess Christ's name before men. You're, you'll do it here in this assembly, and you'll do it the rest of your life because you are giving your life to Jesus. And then you need to die with Christ. We do that in a watery grave. We do that in baptism where we're buried with him 
in his likeness. That he died, was buried, he raised from the dead. So in our baptism we die, we're buried, and we are raised to walk in newness of life. You come get that relationship started. Jesus loves you. He forgives you. You come live for him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the message today to be certain uh, in our marriage. And now we can be certain in our relationship with you. You have laid it all out before us. You risked first. You took the first step. You loved first when we were enemies of the cross of Christ. You gave your, your life for us that we could have life in you. And so today, dear God, I pray for men and women and boys and girls everywhere that they would come clean with you and they would come to, in faith, in faith they would come to the cleansing waters and that they would be baptized into Jesus today. They'd live for you today and forever. And we celebrate heaven that is ours when we do.